everybody, Wonder Hussy here, celebrating my 250,000 subscriber milestone with another Q&A session. That's right, I opened it up to all your questions. I got a bunch of questions. It's gonna be a long enough video as it is, so let's not waste any more time. Let's go. Okay, I separated the questions into four different categories. A lot of questions about travel, a lot of questions about the compound, a lot of questions about my YouTube channel, and then a lot of very personal questions. So first we're gonna start out with travel. Jason wants to know, with that wicked cool camper and your mad skills at creating and producing interesting content and interacting with cool people, how about a cross country documentary? Perhaps ending up in Key West. First of all, I love Key West. I've been there a few times. It's one of my favorite places in the entire USA. And I would love to do a cross-country documentary or just a cross-country trip and shoot videos all along the way. Would I drag this travel trailer with me? Probably not because A, I only get nine miles to the gallon when I'm towing it. And B, it just makes parking and getting around exponentially more difficult. So Jason, yes, I would consider doing a cross-country trip but not in this travel trailer. Okay, the next few questions are kind of related. Gibby wants to know, when are you gonna cross the Mississippi again? And Sarah and Chris, and also David wanna know, will I be coming to the Eastern US? Uh, I think Sarah and Chris wanted to know specifically the Southeast because they live in Georgia and there's some great areas to visit in the Northeast Georgia mountains. Beautiful mountains and waterfalls. Well, Sarah, David, Chris, and Gibby, I don't know when I'm gonna cross the Mississippi again. Well, actually I do. I'm gonna go to Arkansas for the, uh, the total eclipse coming up in April, uh, but I don't have any plans to cross the Mississippi before that. Okay, now Randy wants to know if I have any plans for a jaunt through the big island of Hawaii, which is the only island with hot springs. Randy, I've been trying to get to those hot springs for a long time. I have a very good friend who lives on the big island and I have a standing invitation to go stay at his house anytime I want. And I think he even has a car I can use. So I don't know why I haven't been back there more often. If you look on my channel, I think I went, I did a video at his house back in 2017, maybe. It was called Hawaii versus the desert. He's got a beautiful house. Love that place, love the big island. Definitely want to go to those hot springs. I'm very familiar with, well, I think there's two. There's one that's like a big warm pond. And then there's one that you have to backpack to and dig your own uh, private hot spring. I want to do both of them. And I will, I just don't have a firm date yet. Okay, next we have a question from Stevie Wonder. Wow, I'm flattered that Stevie Wonder watches my, or I guess maybe doesn't watch, but listens to my YouTube channel. Stevie wants to know, when you're up north visiting your mom, how about doing a piece on the sculptures on Florence Avenue in Sebastopol? Okay, Sebastopol is this funky, kind of quirky little hippie town, kind of up near where my mom lives. And I know what you're talking about, Stevie Wonder. I've driven up and down that street and there's a bunch of funky sculptures on it. I think you said you live there. Uh, and if that's the case, awesome. Because every time I drive down and I go, oh, I'd like to make a video about these sculptures, but I would feel like the neighbors would all be looking at me because it's a quiet residential street. I don't want anyone to think I'm, you know, a burglar, you know, up to no good. But if you're offering me an invitation, well, then I guess... <laughs> I could go shoot it, and if anyone had any questions for me, I'd say, hey, go ask Stevie Wonder. Okay, now here's some hot spring questions. Rachel wants to know, what are the best camping spots and hot springs I've been to on the eastern Sierra Nevada side? Okay, on the eastern side of the Sierra Nevada mountains, where I am right now, there may or may not be a hot spring here, and it's a humdinger. But if I was going to give public advice, I would recommend the area across from Mammoth Lakes, okay? Right on the other side of the highway from Mammoth Lakes, there's a little green church. And if you follow that road out into that big, long valley, there's a bunch of hot springs out there. And there's a ton of free camping. So that's probably one of my favorite places to camp in the Eastern Sierra when I'm not here. And then Jessa wants to know, what's your favorite hot spring in New Mexico and your favorite spot to camp? I love New Mexico. It really is the land of enchantment because it's so beautiful. There are a lot of hot springs and there's a ton of free camping. 
I haven't been to all the hot springs in New Mexico, but off the top of my head, I really liked one, and I don't even want to say the name of it because I didn't say the name in my video. It's in the area around Jemez Springs. Gosh, I don't even remember what I called the video, but uh, I'll post a link to it up here. It was a series of pools on a hillside with a waterfall, and gosh, even though it was pouring rain when my sister and I visited, it was so beautiful. We had an amazing time, and I think we camped nearby because uh, Jessa also wanted to know what's my favorite spot to camp. I camped all over the state of New Mexico. In fact, I might say my favorite place to camp in New Mexico was way up on the Colorado border where that, uh, I can't even remember the name of that old timey railroad goes through. Uh, gosh, I was looking for the Fen treasure. I don't remember the name of the place now, but right up against the Colorado border, it looks like the Rocky Mountains. It's absolutely beautiful. That's probably my favorite place to camp in New Mexico. Okay, now some festival questions. Rick wants to know if I've ever been to the Rise Festival uh, outside Las Vegas. No, Rick, I haven't. I've seen footage of it. I, I guess it's a festival where people from town, from the suburbs, go out and they let these lanterns go up into the sky, like paper lanterns. And the first year they did it, they left a ton of trash in the desert below. And so I kind of have mixed feelings on the Rise Festival. I mean, I'm sure they learned their lesson after that first time. I'm sure they clean up after themselves now. But also just the idea of all these lanterns with flames and I'm going up in the desert air, it seems kind of dangerous. I mean, I'm sure they take the proper precautions uh, so that all those nice folk from Vegas can have their little festival experience and go out in the desert and make a wish and let a lantern go. Uh, I haven't been to it and I don't have any plans to go to it, but I would consider it. And then Dan wants to know if I've considered going to the Mad Max Festival in Southern California. He thinks it's called Wasteland. Dan, I've been to Wasteland Weekend and I made a video there. And I can't keep putting links up here because they only allow you to do a certain amount. So I'll put the link to my Wasteland Weekend video in the description. So you can check that out. It was a really fun festival. I liked it a lot more than I thought I was going to. The creativity absolutely blew me away. Okay, Vicky wants to know if I ever did a video on Empire, Nevada. What's left of it, anyway. Okay, if you saw the movie Nomadland, Frances McDormand's character uh, is a woman who ends up having to move into a van because the town she's living in basically dries up. Well, that's Empire, Nevada. It's actually right on the way to Burning Man. I just drove through it twice on my way there and back. But I had this trailer with me and I had a bunch of stuff going on. I didn't have time to stop and poke around. A. B. There's actually still people living there. I think they reopened the gypsum plant. And it's not a ghost town. Uh, it's not abandoned. There's people living there trying to make lives that probably wouldn't appreciate some nosy YouTuber poking around their business. That being said, if you live in Empire and you know my channel and you know that I would do a respectful job of covering your town, hit me up. Okay, Rick wants to know, will you ever come to Canada? I realize there are issues in doing so, but they are solvable. Okay, I had a DUI in 2010, so that's... 13 years ago now. I think it's off my record, but I'm not quite sure. I think my understanding is that when you cross the Canadian border, if you've had any kind of criminal conviction, no matter how long in the past, they have the discretion of not letting you into the country. And even with George W. Bush, when he was president, on an official state visit, okay? It was an official visit as head of state. He had a DUI back in 1985 for driving around all coked up. And he had to pay some kind of special fee or hire an attorney or do something to get into the country. So even the president has to abide by these rules. I guess there is uh, just a fine you can pay. And so, yeah, I would love to go to Canada. Oh, my God. Are you kidding? I've heard such great things about the hot springs in British Columbia and the nude beach on Vancouver Island, Wreck Beach. Love to go to both of those. I just have to figure out these legal issues first. And... I can't seem to get a straight answer from anyone. People send me links all the time and they all say different things. Some say, yeah, you can pay this fee, but it only allows you to travel through Canada. You can't just travel around Canada. You need to get going and get to Alaska. Well, I don't know what the truth is. And so if anybody has a solid, legal, definitive answer for me, like if you are an attorney who specializes in people going to Canada with DUIs, hit me up. Oh, it just started to rain. How nice. Okay, uh, Lay wants to know, well, he's got a two-parter. Did you chase Heidi Fleiss out of Pahrump? As soon as you moved in, she moved out. Also, when will be your first video from a foreign country, not Canada? Well, Lay, I hate to tell you, but you're wrong. 
on both counts. Heidi Fleiss, if you know who that is, she was the Hollywood madam. Uh, she got busted for running a high-end prostitution ring in Los Angeles back in the 2000s, I think, late 90s. Uh, she moved to Pahrump and opened a parrot sanctuary. And I hate to tell you this, Lay, but I didn't chase anybody out. She's still in Pahrump, alive and well, and I would love to meet her. And furthermore, Lay, I have made videos out of the country and not in Canada. You must have been asleep at the wheel when I went to Namibia and Baja, California. By the way, I'll put the links to all these videos I'm mentioning in the description to the video so you can check them out for yourself if you don't believe that I went to Namibia. Okay, now Josh wants to know if I've ex considered exploring hot springs or other things that interest me outside the continental U.S. Uh, well, I kind of just addressed that. I have been outside the U.S. in my videos. I didn't go to any hot springs in Namibia, but I did in Baja, California. Josh also wants to know if I've looked into sponsors. And no, I haven't. I'm really bad at business, and I always feel like... I would feel like a jerk if I reached out to... Well, I mean, ideally, I'd like to be sponsored by Toyota. Dear Toyota, I have 250,000 YouTube subscribers. What are you going to give me? You know, it just seems arrogant, pretentious, and greedy. That being said, I know I could be sponsored, and I probably should start working on some of those deals. Okay, now Marty, Marty wants to know... Where do you think you got your unafraid attitude to go on so many solo female camping traveling adventures? Seems to me you have an unbelievable amount of trust in strangers being good people. Well, you're right. Uh, I am a very trustworthy person. Uh, some might say naive, but I don't know. I've traveled around a good bit, and in my experience, a stranger is just a friend you haven't met yet. Uh, it's true. People are generally much cooler than you would assume if you just sit home and watch all these crime shows on TV, you think everybody's out to get you and there's a serial killer behind every corner. Well, if you actually leave the house and go out exploring, you find out that is not the case. And I actually think being a female explorer is an advantage because people give you even less grief, I think, because you're not perceived as a threat. Okay, if you're a dude out camping by yourself and some other dude comes by your campsite, you know, next thing you know, it's a pissing contest. That doesn't happen with women. They don't perceive you as any kind of threat. You're just some gal camping by herself and they want to protect you. They want to take care of you. At least that's been my experience. And yes, uh, I do recognize my privilege uh, because I, I know white privilege is a very loaded topic, but it's true. As a white gal, nobody thinks I'm up to no good. They all just think, oh, look at her. How cute. And no, if you're wondering, I certainly do not consider myself woke. Uh, I just recognize the fact that there is such a thing as white privilege. Anyway, now Ted wants to know, with all your adventures that you go on, have you ever had any major mechanical problems that you needed someone to come rescue you or run into any really bad people? No, I've never run into any bad people. Uh, and I've never, knock wood, had any... Well, my battery died last summer when I was traveling through Colorado City, Arizona. It's right on the Utah-Arizona border. It's where all the fundamentalist polygamist Mormons live, you know, the, the guys with all them sister wives. And my battery died. Thankfully, I was in a place with a uh, cell signal. I was on a paved road, so AAA came and got me. And several people where I was pulled over asked me if I needed help. So it was actually a very positive experience. Thankfully, that's the only major mechanical trouble I've run into while I'm traveling around. Uh, that being said, my rig is getting older. She's got 175,000 plus miles on her. And so I am kind of more worried now about going into these super remote off-roady areas because, golly, if something broke, I mean, it's a Toyota 4Runner. I'm confident that the motor and the engine are going to last forever, but, you know, it's taken a lot of body damage because of all the off-roading I do. And so, you know, if one of my leaf springs or something broke, I would have no idea how to do a field repair and get out of there. But that's why I always travel with my SOS uh, Garmin inReach. And so my plan, in case you're wondering, if I ever do have some kind of terrible trouble in the back country. My plan is to text my sister on my inReach and she has access to my Facebook page, my official Facebook page, not the group, the page. Uh, and she'll post on my behalf, hey, Wonder Hussy needs help. And she'll put my coordinates and I'm sure some cool off-road search and rescue type folks will come help me out. <laughs> And it'll make for a very interesting video. Okay, now Aaron, aka Aztec Girl or Toltec Girl, wants to know what's the scariest thing that's ever happened to you while you were out camping or exploring by yourself? 
Well, I've answered this question in probably three other Q and A's. Everybody always wants to know this. Nothing scary has ever really happened to me other than one time I was camping uh, in the middle of nowhere, Nevada, middle of the night, went to sleep, locked my car, car alarm went off and I couldn't figure out what it was. You know, the alarm went off. I opened the door. I looked around. There's nobody around for a hundred miles. No cows, no nothing. Oh, okay. So I went pee, went back to sleep, locked the car, went back to sleep. 10 minutes later, woo -hoo, alarm went off again. Oh, open the door. Is it a cow bumping up against my car? What is it? Well, it was nothing. And so after that, I thought, oh gosh, something's wrong with my electrical system. This alarm's just going to keep going off if I lock the door. So I didn't lock the door after that. I just went back to sleep and I have never locked my door <laughs> since then. I just sleep with my car door unlocked because most of the time when I'm camping, almost a hundred percent of the time, I pick a spot that's way, way far away from anyone else. So there's nobody to worry about. Okay, here's a good one. Rose wants to know, have you ever been arrested or contacted by the cops at a hot springs for nudity or being on private property? Well, yes, I have for both. Uh, I wasn't, well, I was at a hot spring one time between Goldfield, Nevada and Tonopah, Nevada, middle of nowhere, Nevada. It was like three in the morning on a Monday night. I was doing a photo shoot with this photographer friend of mine who uh, I used to work with a lot. He would take pictures of the Milky Way. And so we'd have to be out there at like one, two in the morning when the Milky Way is up. And uh, he always put me at the bottom of the photo. Uh, like he wanted a nude model at the bottom of this vast starscape. But it was always real cold out at one, two in the morning. So I go, well, why don't we go over to this hot spring? That way I can stay in the hot spring and stay warm while you shoot the Milky Way. And then when you're ready for me, I'll just hop out, stand in the picture and then get back in the hot spring to stay warm. Great, okay, so we're out there shooting. There was another woman who happened to be at the hot spring at 3 a.m. on a Monday night. Me and the other lady were hanging out in the hot spring talking, and the police came by at 3. Okay, maybe it wasn't 3, but it was like 1 in the morning on a Monday night in the middle of nowhere between Goldfield and Tonopah, Nevada, and the Esmeralda County Sheriff's deputy rolled up and told us we couldn't be soaking naked. And I was like, why not? And he goes, well, there might be kids present. At one o'clock in the morning on a Monday night in the middle of nowhere, I really doubt it, but I can't argue with the police, so I had to put my bikini top on, and he was just bored. I ended up having a conversation with him. Uh, I think he probably got exiled out there from some other sheriff's department. There's nothing going on in Esmeralda County. It's like the second least populated county in the continental U.S. or something like that. So he was bored. I guess he just was in the habit of going to check on the hot spring and see if there's any rowdy partiers, which there weren't. It was just me and this other lady sitting there peacefully in pitch black darkness, I might add. Nobody's eyes could have possibly been offended by our sinful nipples, but we had to put our swimsuits on anyway. And as for part two of that question, have I ever gotten in trouble for trespassing? Yes, actually I did. When I first started this channel, I don't know, I'd go in any abandoned building, regardless of whether it was posted no trespassing or not. I just, I thought it was more of an advisory, like a liability thing just to protect the property owner from lawsuits. Well, one day I got a phone call from Lake Mead Law Enforcement and they very nicely asked me to take down a couple videos I had made at abandoned marinas out there. Okay, if you go to Lake Mead, the lake level is sinking, the lake's drying up, there's all these marinas that used to be able to launch out of that now are <laughs> above the water, so they had to shut them down. And I made videos at a couple of them because it's very interesting poking around these dried up abandoned marinas on the edge of this dried up lake. It's very, talk about Mad Max, very post-apocalyptic. But this uh, guy who called me said, well, we don't want to encourage other people trespassing out there, blah, blah, blah. So, you know, we'd like you to take those down. And he didn't demand that I did. He was very nice. And I didn't want to get fined for trespassing. So I said, okay, yes, sir, officer. And I took both those videos down. And now I'm a lot more careful about trespassing. In fact, I don't do it. Okay, now we have a question from Anonymous who wants to know that when I'm skinny dipping in the hot spring, you know, you can worry about the brain eating species entering the nasal passage and keep your head above water. But what about the lower open orifices of the body? Is there concern there? No, there's not. The Negleria fowleri uh, brain eating amoeba can only enter through your olfactory nerves. It cannot enter through your vagina, if that's what you're wondering. And it can't enter through your anus either. Or for that matter, it couldn't enter through your pee hole for you guys out there. It can only get in through your nose. So there's no need to worry. Anonymous also wanted to know how the, our property was after the storm hit. Well, I made a video showing that, so you probably already have the answer. It was fine. He also wanted to know if I've ever signed up or put my name on the list to travel to outer space. 
which yes, I did sign up for. There was this Japanese billionaire who booked a moon flight. Like he was going to go in orbit around the moon and he was giving all the other seats on the rocket away to artists. And so I shot my video. It's on my channel somewhere, my audition video, because it's, it's called Dear Moon. I'll put it in the description. I don't know if it ever happened. He seemed like he was interested. I mean, he friended me on Facebook. So I thought, all right, he's going to pick me. But then I never heard anything more and it wasn't in the news or anything. So I'm not sure if he ever went to space. Uh, I certainly can't afford to buy a space ticket myself. But if there are any persons of wealth, billionaires and such watching this video who want a fun person to go to space with and don't mind buying me a ticket, I would totally go. Uh, Anonymous also wants to know, oh, have I figured out what my next vehicle will be? What next vehicle I would purchase? I think I'm going to buy another Forerunner. Uh, I just don't know when I'm going to do it. I'm kind of waiting to see what goes on with prices and I don't know. I just don't have the money right now. And then finally, he also wants to know, or she, if my magic bean business is still going. And yes, it is. And if I sell enough magic beans, well, maybe I'll be able to afford a new Forerunner. <laughs> okay, now Mr. Handsome wants to know, what is your favorite adventure? Well, if you mean what was my favorite adventure in terms of like, what was my favorite video that I ever made? Well, one of my favorites was right here where I'm camped right now. I hiked up into the hills to see if I could find any dirty tree carvings. Okay, there's these shepherds that come through this area and they all through Nevada. These Basque shepherds are from the Basque region of Spain, uh, the Spain-France borderlands. Uh, they immigrated here way back in the day and they all became shepherds or a lot of them became shepherds. Anyway, they would take their sheep up to these summer pastures and then they would get lonely while they were up there and they would carve into the bark of the aspen trees these very pornographic <laughs> cartoons of women. And so one time I was camping here with my friend Terry and I go, hey, you know, the shepherd just came through the other day. Matter of fact, the shepherd did just come through here the other day. Uh, I'll show you some B-roll of that. Anyway, uh, I decided to hike up into the hills above here and see if we could find any of those dirty tree carvings. And we did. And it was, I really didn't expect to. So it ended up being one of my favorite adventures ever. Another adventure I really liked was when my friend Scott and I were trying to find OMG Hot Springs, which is a hot spring that was bulldozed many years ago. So even though there was nothing to really find at the end of the uh, adventure, it just, it ended up being so much fun when we, it was hard to figure out where the spot was. And when we finally found it, we found the old trash pile where the hot spring used to be, all the old beer cans and stuff. It was just, I don't know, for me, it was one of my favorite adventures. Okay, now Bill has a really interesting question. He basically divides my types of videos into four categories. One being mines, ruins, hot springs in the middle of nowhere, Death Valley life, living at the compound, sleaze, like me walking around the sleazy parts of Vegas, and then random adventures like going to Burning Man or going to a you know, some weird toxic town like I just did in Butte, Montana. And so he wants to know which of those four categories do I find the most satisfying? I like them all. I don't think there is an answer to that. I like making the Death Valley Life videos because it's fun to show what's going on. People are fascinated by what it's like to live in Death Valley. But of course, I love finding a beautiful new hot spring that is some kind of crazy backpack adventure or crazy off-roading adventure to get to. But I also like going to these festivals. I mean, going to Burning Man, that's always fun to make a video about. And sleaze. Well, sleaze will always have a soft spot in my heart. I really like going to Vegas and poking around the janky parts of town. So I'm sorry, Bill. I don't have an answer for you. I like them all equally. It's like children. You can't pick your favorite. Bill also wants to know if I would make a vlog about how I acquired my Forerunner. Uh, I did make a vlog way back when I first got this Forerunner, kind of talking about it. A very generous viewer actually sent me a bunch of money to buy a car. And that was way back when I first started YouTubing. And unfortunately, it hasn't happened again since. I thought about telling the story in a video because it's a really interesting, I mean, really interesting story. But that person wants their anonymity protected and I think they still watch this channel. So I don't know, I just didn't want to embarrass them. And on a related note, Clark K wants to know what year my Forerunner is. It's a 2017, I got it brand new in 2017. Okay, Jan, or Jan, wants to know, who's my favorite traveling companion? Well, I have three favorite traveling companions. Me, myself, and I. And yeah, it's true, I get lonely traveling around solo a lot, but especially if I'm shooting videos, most of the time it's just easier to be alone because you don't have to worry about somebody else getting bored or getting scared or having to pee or has to stop for lunch. You can just you know, complete the mission on your own schedule and not have to worry about somebody else. That being said, I do... I used to really like traveling with my sister. She's not much for travel anymore. Uh, and then other friends that I had, 
you know, I will. I'll do more trips with friends in the future, but my favorites are probably when I'm solo. Jan or Jan also wants to know what's next on my bucket list. Uh, next on my bucket list, well, I have to pack this whole trailer up tomorrow and tow it back home to Death Valley, but I guess that's not really an adventure. After I get back to Death Valley, the first trip I'm planning to go on... Well, somebody invited me to the film festival parade in Lone Pine, California. They actually invited me to march in the parade leading a burrow. <laughs> I haven't decided yet if I will do that, uh, but that could be my next adventure. Or wait, I guess the question was what's next on my bucket list, not what's my next adventure. I mean, as fun as leading a burrow in the Lone Pine Film Festival Parade would be, it's not exactly on my bucket list. I still really want to go to Serpentine Hot Springs in Alaska. It's really hard to get you. It's going to be very expensive. It's going to be a humdinger of an expedition. I'm just looking for cool people to go with. Um, I haven't really made any firm plans, so I can't say that that's next on my bucket list. I'd also like to go back to Baja, California, because when I went last time the people i was traveling with were not very much fun and i always thought that would be a cool place to go with people that i actually like tina asks have i ever considered bringing a youtube fan with me on any of my adventures it could be fun yeah it could be fun and i'm open to it in fact i have gone on adventures with people who watch my channel before i mean if somebody hits me up and proposes a some kind of cool fun thing uh, i might might say yes and i would go on an adventure with a fan uh if you mean like do i want to raffle off a spot with me on my next trip that's an interesting idea um it's just hard because you never know like how somebody is at traveling like some people are high maintenance and uh, nobody wants to get stuck with that okay katie wants to know what's the best driving song love this question i am obviously a huge music fan i listen to all kinds of music while i'm driving but one song in particular i listen to a lot when i'm setting off on an expedition and it's probably a song that hardly anybody if anybody watching this has heard of okay there was this band called the klf in the i guess early 90s late 80s and they did a song with tammy wynette the country singer and klf was like this anarchist electronic music band but somehow they paid tammy wynette enough money to drag her out of retirement in nashville and they did this song called justified and ancient all bound for moo moo land moo moo land moo moo land it's a great song now paul wants to know he says he loves encountering places where there were abandoned homesteads with apple and pear trees still bearing fruit in my travels have i encountered many places such as that i feel like i've encountered at least a couple in fact i can think of two offhand one there were these two brothers that had an orchard up on the edge of the Alvord Desert in the Steens Mountains in Oregon. And I made a whole video about that. I'll put the link to that in the description too. They had an orchard. And even though they died many years ago, the trees were still bearing fruit. It was pretty cool to see. Unfortunately, I got there a little bit too early. Uh, the fruit wasn't ripe yet. And then I made another video at a ranch on the far eastern edge of Death Valley. There's a little corner of Death Valley that pokes out into Nevada. Most of Death Valley is in California, but there's this one little piece in Nevada. And there's this ranch called the Strozzi Ranch, uh, where some Italian guy named Strozzi used to go take his cows in the summer. And he had an orchard there, too. And I think there were apples on the trees when I explored it. Okay, the last travel question is from Stephen. Stephen asks if I've ever considered becoming an archaeologist or at least becoming involved in an archaeological expedition. Wow, what a compliment. I've never considered becoming an archaeologist. I don't know enough about it. I haven't studied it. I'm an amateur. I'm a Jill of all trades, mistress of none. I like poking around stuff, which I guess is what archaeology is, but I never considered actually going to school for it. I would love to become involved in an archaeologist's expedition, but I don't know that they would have me because I don't know the proper protocols for digging stuff up and I'd probably just screw everything up. Okay, that's all the travel questions. Now we're moving on to questions about the compound. Uh, Sierra Madre Tailgater asks, even with all your storytelling, I'm not sure you've ever explained exactly why you left the big town to move to the sticks. Unless I missed something, all I remember about your little town is that you always wanted to move there. From most accounts, your big town had just about anything anyone would want. Ignoring the touristy part, you had grocery stores, movies, mechanics, an airport, drinking water, Wi-Fi, low taxes, etc. And you were reasonably close to plenty of outdoorsy stuff. Don't get me wrong, I live on the Texas-Mexico border. It's just that where I live reminds this person of where he lives near Terlingua, a place people love to visit. But 
Okay, so basically he's asking, why did I leave Vegas, the comfortable life in Vegas, to go live in the middle of nowhere? Well, have you ever lived in Vegas? Just kidding, Vegas, I don't mean to bag on Vegas. There's actually a lot to be said for Vegas, and I do re recognize more of that now that I've left. Like, it was a very easy place to live, but it was, you know, I can't even say it was boring, because Vegas is anything but boring, but there's so much crime now, and people just seem like they're getting crazier and crazier, and that wasn't really what drove me out, but it is a factor. I feel safer living in the middle of nowhere. It's certainly more peaceful, and it's just, even though Vegas is interesting, living where I live, <laughs> is really interesting. And yes, it is uh, exponentially more difficult to do anything. And I have to drive to Vegas to go to the mechanic, to go to the doctor, buy real groceries, to do any number of things. But I do still like living <laughs> where I do. And then John has kind of a related question. He wants to know why I moved to Tacopa, that's the town I live in, instead of Pahrump, Nevada. Pahrump is like 35 miles from where I live. Well, if you've ever been to Pahrump and you've ever been to Tacopa, well, let's just say you can sense the differences, and Tacopa just felt more like my kind of place. And that's not to disparage Pahrump. I've actually become very fond of Pahrump, and I would consider buying property in Pahrump. But it's not exactly the same as Tacopa. And there aren't any hot springs. Uh, now we have a question from Mike Z, my friend with the Astro Van. He said, okay, what's the list of things you'd like me to try and get did at your pad? Mike Z, if you watched the videos I made with him, he has a badass four-wheel drive Astro van. He's also a carpenter, and he offered to come out and help us with some projects at our compound in Death Valley. How about that? I told him I'd be happy to pay his rate. You know, I'm not trying to get anyone to come work for free. Um, well, except for my friend Randy. Hi, Randy. Love you. Mwah! <laughs> but Mike, uh, if you come out to visit, uh, well, I need to have a new door hung on the casita. That's probably the main thing. The door is real busted. Uh, there, the casita needs some minor, I feel like they're minor, kind of cosmetic repairs to the trim, the exterior trim. Um, and then if you had enough time, well, if you're doing the door, might as well get a couple new windows too, because the windows I have now are pretty leaky. But hey, even if you can only do the door, I'd still be glad to see you. Here's a question from another anonymous viewer. How do you feel about going through the extra effort of driving long distances to soak, get groceries, hang out at big events, and living out in the desert? I guess I'm spoiled having everything within a five mile radius. Well, like it goes back to what I answered a couple questions ago. Yeah, life was a lot easier living in Vegas. I mean, I could drive just about anywhere in five minutes, but it was just kind of boring, you know, living in the city. It's just very typical. I wanted adventure. You know, I wanted the feeling of being a homesteader out in the middle of nowhere. And yes, sometimes I do question how much do I really want to be an adventurer and a homesteader? Because it sure would be a lot easier to move back to the city. But for now, the enjoyment outweighs the disadvantages. Okay, now Gypsy K and G want to know, do you get people following you or showing up at your compound? Well, <laughs> Yes, people do show up at the compound on an alarmingly regular basis, and everybody who's shown up has been very nice, but it's still kind of like, who shows up at some random person's house uninvited? I find it very odd, and again, everybody who has come to my place has been very nice, so I don't mean to complain about anyone in particular, and I'm always very gracious when they do show up. I'm happy to meet people and like sit and chat, but you know, a lot of time I'm in the middle of editing a video or trying to get stuff done, and one time somebody even came and knocked on my bedroom door because the casita is basically just my bedroom and it was like, hi, can I help you? <laughs> but I'm kind of used to that from Burning Man, you know, or even camping here in this trailer. I've had, I think, f at least four people show up at my campsite. They figured out where I'm camping and they just wanted to come say hi to me. So lucky for me and lucky for them, uh, I'm not that private of a person, and so I don't call the police or anything like that. Now, John wants to know, we all know how much you love getting away for the summer, but how much do you miss home, and how do you feel upon returning to Death Valley? Well, I'm actually looking forward to going back to Death Valley. I'm going back day after tomorrow. I'm going to pack up tomorrow and then go home the next day. Um, I guess I'm looking forward to it. I mean, that being said, last night I did get a little melancholy that I have to leave this beautiful place and go back to the real world. But again, that's kind of what I like about living on the compound in the middle of nowhere. It's not even like the real world. There's so much weird stuff going on out there that 
it's hardly a humdrum existence. And I am uh, excited to go back after the summer because everybody leaves for the summer and now they're all coming back and all the restaurants are reopening and it'll be interesting to see how people have changed and there's some new people that are moving to town and uh, we're going to have a bunch of parties planned. Uh, oh gosh, the more I think of it, I guess I am looking forward to going back. Okay, Marty also asked, uh, he said he remembers, or she uh, remembered a video showing my sister and her boyfriend leaving the compound to go to Alaska in the bus. And Marty noticed that my sister's back, but no boyfriend mentioned. Is he filling a hole in the wilderness somewhere? <laughs> no, Marty. Uh, her boyfriend's back. And in fact, he was just here the other day. That's right. He showed up at this hot spring and camped out for a couple nights. He had to go to Bakersfield because his school bus... Uh, the shocks are messed up and you can't just take a giant diesel school bus into any four by shop <laughs> to get the shocks worked on. So we had to go to Bakersfield to get that taken care of. And I think he's heading back to the compound after that. And the final question about the compound is from Todd. I've been curious about your mannequins and what you do with them. Obviously you're a big costumer, so I get that part, but I was curious if you use them in a more artistic way than just dressing them. Well, Todd, the idea, I don't even, it's just like dolls, I guess. It's like getting big, giant dolls. My sister and I used to play Barbies all the time when we were little. We loved our Barbies. Uh, so in a way, they're just kind of like giant Barbies. But we don't actually play games with them. They're just mostly standing around the compound in different places looking freaky. They just, they're just sort of art pieces, I guess. I, every now and then we change the outfits on them, like... You know, I'll dress one of them up like Santa Claus at Christmas time, or the one we put a hard hat on when we were doing our big construction job. Uh, I did dress one of them up like an ex-boyfriend, sort of like a big voodoo doll. <laughs> I don't know, man. Uh, we just kind of have fun with them. Okay, that was all the compound questions. Now we're moving along to questions about my YouTube channel. So Terry wants to know, do you ever think about how crazy, weird, awesome, amazing it is that you have all these people that live vicariously through your exploits and you're doing what you enjoy, and your viewers love you, and what you do? How lucky is that? Yes, Terry, I think about that all the time. I don't know. I wish I would have started YouTubing 10 years before I did, because I had a very interesting life when I lived in Vegas and was working as a model. I just, I don't know. I thought, oh, why would anybody want to watch what I do? Uh, I do feel very, very fortunate. I might even say blessed that I finally, after living on this planet for like 40 years, figured out a way to make a living doing something I 100% enjoy. Oh, it's thunder, thunderstorm outside. Ooh, it's so cozy in here right now. Uh, yeah, I'm super duper lucky. I'm flattered that anybody would wanna watch the stuff I do, but uh, hopefully I can continue to be entertaining <laughs> and informative for many more adventures to come. Okay, here's an interesting question. John wants to know, out of 250,000 subscribers, some of those people are famous. Uh, he says, how about some name dropping? Who are some well-known people in the Hussey army? I don't know of any famous people who follow me. Uh, somebody did email me once and told me that they're friends with a well-known or some kind of rock musician who supposedly likes my channel, but they wouldn't say who it was. And I don't even know if they were telling the truth. So unfortunately, John, I don't know of anyone who's even remotely noteworthy who follows my channel. <laughs> Okay, now we're going to get into some kind of spicy questions. Again, I'm not trying to stir the pot. Uh, I'm just answering I, every question that was sent to me. I'm answering. Balkandina wants to know, I know you are a free spirit, but does it ever bother you how many of your man fans are kind of sexist pigs? You're so intelligent and you get mansplained to and objectified so much in the comments. Do you just ignore them? Well, Balkandina, uh, mansplaining... I'm of two minds about, I don't know a lot of things, especially when it comes to mechanical stuff. And I ask people purposely, hey, what should I do about this? So is it mansplaining if they're just trying to explain something to me that I don't know? That being said, I have had some really patronizing comments on Facebook in particular from people, you know, calling me kiddo and I should stay in my lane. And this, it really got me because I have a personal Facebook profile and I have my Wonder Hussy Facebook page, okay? On my Wonder Hussy Facebook page, I keep it politically neutral, blah, blah. Well, on my personal page, it's my personal page. And so I used to just post whatever I wanted until a bunch of viewers started following me on my personal page and then they had problems with me expressing myself. Like this one guy in particular, I remember was like, kiddo, you'll be a lot more successful if you blah, blah, like, butt out, man. Go over to my fan page. I keep it neutral over there. That being said, 
The line between my personal life and public life is almost non-existent now, so I don't even talk about that kind of stuff on my personal page anymore. And as for the objectification part of it, well, I did work as a nude model for a long time and I still post nudies on one of my Instagram accounts, so I guess I'm kinda asking for it. Okay, now Randy wants to know, how do you deal with being around so many MAGA, let's go Brandon, etc.? Okay, he's talking about, uh, I guess, ardent Trump supporters. And I'll just say this, I have friends from, I know this sounds like I'm BSing, but I really do have friends from all across the political spectrum. I have friends who voted for Bernie Sanders, Hillary Clinton, Ralph Nader. Well, that was me. <laughs> don't tell anyone. Uh, that was many years ago. Uh, Donald Trump included. I don't exclude anybody from my reality because of their political beliefs. Now, if somebody is really aggressive and offensive, and that's not just to say MAGA people or let's go Brandon people. I mean, <laughs> the, the worst emails I get, I'm just going to say this, the some of the nastiest emails I get on a regular basis are from a liberal guy who is constantly berating me for voting for Trump. And I don't want to talk about politics, but I will just say this one time. I did not vote for Trump, but this guy seems to think I voted for Trump because I wear American flag sunglasses. I can't be a patriot? And I actually had somebody else tell me their daughter won't watch my videos because I'm a Trumper because I wear those USA glasses. What kind of polarized world are we living in where you won't even watch somebody because you think they voted. Like, I think it's absolutely asinine. That's why I'm friends with people on the far, far left and the far, far right. And when I say far right, I mean, you should see the messages I get from people. I mean, QAnon, all kinds of crazy stuff. And on the left, woo, -woo, -woo same thing. I consider myself to be somewhere right in the middle. Uh, I just like all kinds of people. And to finish the story about the guy always yelling at me for voting for Trump, I keep telling him I didn't vote for Trump and he won't believe me. And so finally I went through my Google photos and I took, I know you're not supposed to, but I took a picture of the ballot box back in 2016 when I voted and I sent him the photo and said, now do you believe me? And he still, he still sends me angry emails. Well, maybe you didn't vote for him, but you're, you don't, he's mad because I don't censor the things people say. Uh, to fit his beliefs. Like I said, there are annoying, obnoxious people on both sides of the spectrum. Okay, enough with these hot button questions. It's awkward. Uh, Larry wants to know, do you have any future dates planned for public appearances? The only kind of public appearance I have planned is we're planning a firehouse fundraiser again in the town where I live. I don't know, it's a flea market, okay? Last time I guess it was more like an arts and crafts Fair. This time it's just going to be a flea market. Everybody in town is going to sell their old stuff and all the money that we raise from selling our stuff will go to the fire department. It's going to be sometime at the end of October. They haven't announced the exact date yet. When I find out, I'll for sure let everybody know. So if you do want to come out for the day, I'll probably set up a tent again and just hang out and meet people and sell my old things as well. So I haven't decided yet if I should sell my old underwear or not. Hmm. Okay, Darla has a question about the laptop and software program I use for editing. Uh, Darla, I use a MacBook, an Apple laptop, and all Apple laptops come with a free editing program called iMovie. It's free. It comes free with every Apple laptop. It's kind of bare bones basic editing software, but it's plenty for me. And you say you're interested in making photo shows of your vacations. Well, it'd be perfect for something like that. So if you have an Apple, use iMovie. If you're using a PC, I think they, Windows has its own... I mean, I used to have a Windows PC when I first started making videos. I think it was called Windows Video Editor or something like that. It's the same thing. It's free. It comes with every Windows or with every Microsoft Office package. Or I guess Windows. I don't know. I don't have Windows anymore. But it's probably on your laptop and it's probably free and it's almost certainly good enough for vacation uh, slideshows. Then she also says she loves my magic beans. Glad you're enjoying those, Darla. Okay, now Pat wants to know, how'd you get to be such a great storyteller? Did it just come naturally or did you develop it over time? He knows I was a shy child, or she knows. I was probably, I was a shy child and probably didn't speak a lot, but my writing shows my ability as well. So it's not just verbal. Are there any great storytellers in your family? Pat believes I could recite the IRS code book and make it sound interesting. Well, I don't know about that. I think what made me a good storyteller, uh, my sister and I were always making up stories when we were little. Like I said, we played with Barbies a lot and 
all kinds of different toys. Like we had those little Fisher Price people. We would play these whole complicated like soap opera type games with all these characters. So I guess it's just in my blood from being young. But what really honed my craft was I'm 12 years older than my brother and nine years older than my other sister. I have another sister. So I did a lot of babysitting for them a lot. You know, I took care of them a lot when I was in college. In fact, I didn't get my driver's license until I was 23. So I have I used to have to go pick my brother up at school. And he his school was probably like a mile from the house, maybe even more. So I had to walk a mile there, and then I had to walk him a mile back. And, you know, kids, they get tired. They start complaining. So I would always have to make up these stories to keep him entertained. And not just walking back from school, like all the time when we were babysitting, Man, we would make up all kinds of, I would make up all kinds of crazy stories. And in fact, it got to the point where I don't even think it was fun for him. Like he just wanted to play army men. He had those little plastic army men in a bucket. My mom got him for his birthday. So he's like, come on, play army men, play army men. Well, I really didn't want to play army men. But I go, all right, I'll play army men. So we're, you know, pew, 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 pew. And they made my guy get shot. Oh, oh no, I'm shot. I'm, di I'm dying. I, I can feel the life slipping out of my body. Tell my wife I love her. Tell little Jimmy and, and tell little Susie. I'm sorry, I'm gonna miss her birthday. Next thing you know, my brother's crying, stop it, you're not playing it right. And that was the last time he asked me to play army men. Okay, Michael wants to know, what advice would you give a 60 year old guy, his 25 year old daughter and son-in-law that are considering following in your footsteps? I think he means traveling around the country. I don't think you meant YouTubing, but my advice would be to do it. It seems overwhelming at first, but it's really not that hard once you get started. You don't have to get a trailer. You don't have to buy a van. You can just go sleep in your car somewhere or even sleep in a tent. There's forest service land, BLM land. Even if you have to go to a state park or campground in every state, there's cool places to camp in every state. Just go out and try it for a weekend and you'll find that it's addicting, I think. I know I didn't camp by myself until I was... Gosh, I would, I think over 40, I never camped alone. And my sister, my sister, I remember my, I was going to go meet my sister down in Mexico when she, her boss that she used to work for had a vacation house in Baja that he said we could go stay in. And so she went down there ahead of me and she stopped and camped by herself on the shores of the Salton Sea on her way down in a tent. And I remember thinking, oh my God, you slept in a tent by yourself? Yikes. Oh. And then shortly thereafter, she did a cross country trip solo in her forerunner, sleeping in the back of her forerunner. She drove all the way across the country and back. And I thought, well, golly, if my sister can do it, you know, she's younger than me, then I can do it. And so I really have my sister. I never thought about that. I have my sister to thank for making me who I am today. So basically, uh, yeah, like I just said, go out and do it. Give it a try. I think it's a great idea and I think you guys will enjoy it. If you did mean YouTubing about your adventures as well, I actually recommend that too. It's a lot of work and it can be stressful, but I find it to be very, very re rewarding because I meet so many interesting people. I get so many cool emails from people who watch my stuff. Um, it's just nice to know that you're making a difference, however small, in somebody's day. I won't say life. I'll just say day. Okay, now Wade has a very long question that I'm just going to paraphrase. He's asking about TikTok. He follows this gal on TikTok and she got, let's see, she has 2.1 million plus subscribers on TikTok. But on YouTube, she only has, mm, I can't, not that many. He just wants to know how TikTok, any thoughts how TikTok has been a goldmine for her channel and what could be perceived as a domestic platform, YouTube, be slower to grow. Well, I think it's, I don't understand how TikTok works, but I don't know how anyone makes money on TikTok because you can't show ads on TikTok. Who's going to sit and watch a commercial for a one minute video or however long videos are on TikTok now? So I don't know how people make money on TikTok. I don't even think TikTok itself is making money or if it is, it's not making much money. I think oh, my personal opinion, of course, I'm biased to YouTube. But I feel like TikTok is kind of like a flash in the pan short form content. I don't know. I mean, it is very popular. Maybe it is here to stay, but, uh, I just, I don't know this gal that he's talking about. I guess she's getting a bunch of views on TikTok. Is that translating to money for her? I don't know. Um, mm, wait, I'm sorry. I don't know enough about TikTok to really answer your question. Okay. Roy wants to know, what do I think about this idea? He says I could do a 1940s world war II style photo shoot. 
thinking I could re recreate one of those uh, aircraft style nose art photos in 40s pinup style clothing. I could go to the Army Depot in Hawthorne, Nevada to pose. Roy, I've already done a photo shoot like that. It was on my calendar in a few years ago. I'll put the picture over this uh, as B-roll so you can see for yourself. Been there, done that. Okay, Peter has an interesting question about my theme song. Wonder Hussy, hey, where you gonna go now? He asks, would I consider uploading the full length version of the song to my channel? Maybe in the context of another channel trailer. I do have the rights to that song. The guy who wrote it and recorded it, Michael St. Leon of Switchyard Studios in Nashville, Tennessee. A wonderful, super cool man. I met him through this photographer that I used to do a lot of photo shoots with. And he actually wrote the song for one of the photo shoots we did. And then he said I could use it for my YouTube channel. And so I do. Um, but I just clipped a little bit of it out because nobody wants to sit through a three minute intro every video. I suppose I could do a special video of the entire song and just put B-roll from all my adventures in it. And uh, that's an interesting idea, Peter. Thank you for that. I just may do that. Okay, last question about my channel and then we're gonna get into the personal questions. <laughs> Daniel, Vincent, and their fur babies, Jack and Oliver, want to know, as an artist's soul, what sources or themes inspire my creativity? Your costumes, video ideas, your home. I don't know what inspires my creativity. I've always been really creative and really out there and really weird. I mean, like I was saying when I was a kid, me and my sister playing all these crazy games and we used to wear all these crazy outfits and in high school, I carried a teapot and then I moved to Vegas and got a pink car. And now I'm sitting in the middle of the mountains in this <laughs> travel trailer. I don't know. I'm, I guess I'm lucky. Creativity is something you're born with and I always have ideas and it, it's never a dull moment. It's never boring. To my detriment often, like if I would just settle for a boring life, living in Vegas, you know, wearing the same black turtleneck and blue jeans every day, life would be a lot easier. But life would also be a lot less fun. Okay, now it's time for the personal questions. And some of these are very personal. John B asks, what color would you say your hair is? Uh, I'd say brown and it's not looking too good right now. Apologies, but I've been camping for a while and <laughs> it needs to be washed. But yeah, I'd say brown hair. He also wants to know, where do I buy my ranch water? And I'm still not sponsored by ranch water. I know everybody probably thinks I am because I'm always drinking it. No, I've never gotten a single free can from them before. I just like to drink it because it's only 4% alcohol. Uh, I drank a full strength margarita the other day out of a can and whoo, it's like 12%. Man, who drinks this? Like, I like these because you can have one or two and it doesn't, you know, impair your thinking, let's just say. I buy them at... Well, they used to sell them at Smith's Grocery Store in Pahrump, which is a chain of grocery stores, Smith's. I think it's like Kroger. Uh, Smith's is in Nevada, Utah, New Mexico, I think. They don't sell them at Smith's anymore in Pahrump, so I got to go to Vegas and I get them at Sprouts Health Food Market because obviously it's a <laughs> health food. Um, I've also bought them. I bought them in Wyoming at a, gosh, I don't know what it was in Wyoming. What grocery stores do they have in Wyoming? Like an Albertsons or something. They had them there. I am particular to this brand. Sorry about the glare, but it's called Lone River. I've tried other ranch waters before and these are my favorites. That being said, this one here is the spicy. They come in a variety pack and spicy is my least favorite. So I always have a bunch of spices left, but uh, anyway, the question was where I buy them and I already answered that. Okay, Paula says, kind of silly, but I noticed when you were soaking your feet, your toe next to your big toe is longer than your big toe on both feet. Do you have to accommodate for the longer toe <laughs> when shoe shopping? Does your sister have a longer toe too? Well, it's hard to show, but my, oh, sorry, my feet are dirty. This toe is longer than that toe. And I think that means you're a domineering personality is what I've been told. <laughs> mm. I don't actually know if my sister's like that. I'm gonna, I don't know. I'm gonna look at my sister's feet when I get home. I thought I knew everything about my sister, but I don't. And yes, it does. I do have to accommodate for that when shoe shopping. And that's why I always wear flip-flops. I have long toes in general. Sorry if you're not into feet. I know it's kind of gross. My toes are long, real long. And so when I put shoes on, they get jammed up and the toenail always falls off. And I freaking hate wearing closed toed shoes. That's why you always see me walking around these sketchy places in flip-flops. And if I do have to wear a shoe, I got those Hoka One One hiking boots that have a really big clown toe box. So they're okay to wear. And then the only other shoes I like wearing are these kind of uh, furry boots, you know, fake Uggs. I don't have the budget for Uggs. And in fact, 
These are getting kind of busted too, but these kind of boots, because you know, they're comfortable. They have plenty of room for the toes. I wear those in the winter. Hoka One One when hiking and Teva Mush is the name of the style. Flip flops at all of the times. Okay, now David says, has have you ever been told you look a little like Carrie Fisher, Princess Leia? Yes, actually, I have been told that. I used to dress like Princess Leia for Halloween every year. Uh, I would do the whole cinnamon buns hairdo and I had this white dress. And especially when I was younger, I did look, I think, a lot like Carrie Fisher. And it's a huge compliment. Thank you, because she is beautiful. Now, another David, I don't think it's the same David, asks, like you, I'm pretty naturally pretty introverted and shy, but unlike you, I've never properly overcome it. I'm wondering how you managed to do that to become the extrovert we see and how long it has taken for you to feel completely comfortable with the change, if indeed you ever have. I think I talked about this in a video once. I was super shy as a kid, like agonizingly shy, all the way up until my 20s. And I didn't want to be shy because I wanted to have fun and adventures and experience life. And I felt like shy people don't have any of that. And so I've Part of it was just force of will. Like I willed myself, like I'm going to move to Vegas and move away from anybody. I didn't know anybody in Vegas. I'm going to get this job where I don't know anyone that I have to walk into a room full of people and take, go, hi, I'm here to take your photo and charge you for it. That was very difficult for a shy person. What helped me, and this is going to sound really messed up, is alcohol. I didn't start drinking. I didn't drink in high school or anything. I was pretty square. But once I started drinking, and I'm not talking about getting blotto, but having a cocktail or two, it loosens you up, and they call it the great social lubricant. So I guess in my early 20s, alcohol actually really helped me not be so shy and it helped me get the confidence to talk to other people, and especially when I moved to Vegas and I had to go into that room full of people and take their photos. So my first job in Vegas was as a photographer in a showroom at the MGM Grand, I had to go into the theater while everyone's sitting there waiting for the show to start and go, hey, we're here to take your souvenir photo. You know, you can buy it if you like it after the show. Well, it would have been very difficult for me to do as a shy person. So I had a cocktail before work every night and it was just, initially I would have like a Malibu and orange juice, which is like hardly any alcohol content. So a mild cocktail, just enough to where I wasn't so shy anymore. And I did that for years, probably... I would say at least three years, three, about three years, three, four years. And then finally one day I went, huh, I don't need to have a cocktail before work anymore. I'm perfectly comfortable just going in there sober and talking to people. And so I do think I changed my personality, which I didn't think that was possible, but I was able to make myself extroverted. Now I'm still an introvert at heart, so I still need my alone time. You know, I'm always saying I want to be alone. I, I really prefer having at least 12 hours to myself a day, you know, nine of which I sleep, but and that's the minimum. I really prefer more like, I mean, if I could be like open for business eight hours a day, that would be ideal. Like, okay, I'm a people person from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. And then I'm an introvert. So I think that answers your question. You asked how long it took for me to feel completely comfortable with the change. I think I'm completely comfortable with it now. And it's about 20 years after I had to quit quit having to have a drink before work. So it took a while, but I would say five, 10 years is how long it took to change myself. Okay. Michael wants to know what advice about life would I give myself as a teenager if I could go back in time? Well, I would tell myself not to be so dang shy. I mean, I wouldn't have wanted to start drinking as a teenager, so that wouldn't have worked. But if I could have somehow convinced myself because, I mean, when I say I was shy, I was really shy. I didn't have any boyfriends in high school. I didn't even really have any friends in high school, just my sister. And college, same thing. I didn't have any boyfriends in college. And really not one or two kind of sort of friends. Uh, I was just really shy. And also my family was very clannish. And I did have a lot of babysitting obligations, so I couldn't just go out to the mall after school every day and hang out with my friends. So that was part of it. But I would, I guess I would just... I don't know. You can't just tell yourself not to be shy, but I don't know. I would just say you, you are worthy. You're going to be okay. And then I don't know if this is the same Michael, but uh, another question from Michael, what is your message to your 30 year old self? Well, same when I was 30, uh, I had just kind of started to have adventures, um, and do things. 
And I would have just, well, when I was 30, I was also dating a guy who was very conservative. He was a wonderful guy, just a great boyfriend, but he was just socially a square. And his dream in life was he just wanted to have a house with a white picket fence, kids, a wife, a dog. He wanted to coach little league, very white bread existence. And that's great. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. I, Norman Rockwell is my favorite artist and that's no lie. But it really wasn't for me. And I was just so into him and we were having, we had a lot of fun. I really did like him. I think I loved him. Uh, I allowed myself to go along with that path for a while until finally, inevitably, <laughs> it blew up. And I realized, no, 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 no. This is not what I want for my life. I'm way too weird for this. I mean, we bought a house together and he made me put all my kooky stuff into this room in the basement. The house had a basement. And so one room in the basement was like his man cave. And then another room was my kooky room where I had to put, I had one mannequin back then. So I had to put my mannequin down there. My maps, maps are weird. You can't hang those on the wall. Put them in your kooky room. So all my weird art supplies and everything was jammed into this one room in the basement. And then when we finally broke up, which was terrible because we had bought this house together, but it was all in my name. So he moved out. Now all of a sudden I had this huge house I was responsible for. Well, the first thing I did was take the mannequin and all those maps out of the kooky room and into the open. And I've been living like that ever since. So my message to myself at 30 would be, you got to get out of this relationship before you guys buy this house together. Because that turned into a financial nightmare that lasted like oh, years, man. I It was during the recession and I was trying to get a loan modification because I couldn't afford to keep the house myself. Uh, and so I was fetish modeling and nude modeling, doing everything I could to pay the mortgage. I got all these weird roommates living in the basement, anything I could to keep paying that mortgage. But eventually I had to short sell the house and it just, it took many years of my life up and it caused me a lot of grief and angst. It was really an embarrassing time for me. And it was just a bad deal. So if I could go back to myself at 30, I'd say, don't buy that house and get out of this relationship now. Okay, here's another question from Wade, and it's interesting. He says, when your mother followed your father to Germany, to where he was stationed, she chose not to reside on base. I can appreciate reasons to stay at base housing and just as strongly not to stay at base housing. Anyway, he wants to know why my mom decided not to live on base with my dad. Okay, so the backstory is Wade. <laughs> my parents were living in Mendocino County at the time, and I was just three and my sister was a baby, and my dad disappeared one day. He went out to get a, he went to the garage. I, I mean, I only found this out years later. He went out to get something out of the garage. I get a tool or something. And he just never came back, you know, never came back. So he basically abandoned us. He had mental issues. I'm not, you know, here to blast my dad. I love my dad and I understand he had problems, but he basically abandoned my mom. So you tell me, would you go move on base with a guy who abandoned you? I mean, as it was, she was... <coughs> young. I think she was like 25. She had a three-year-old and a one-year-old, you know, and all of a sudden, okay, what do I do? Well, he, he was gone. No idea where he went. Two weeks later, they finally found him. He had enlisted in the army and he was getting sent to Fort Sill, Oklahoma for basic training. And then my mom didn't know what to do. Like, okay, well, I have these two babies and the army will pay for me to go <laughs> to Oklahoma. And even though like the relationship I imagine was probably on pretty weird ground, like with everything going on, she had no choice. So we went to Oklahoma and we did live on base housing there, but then he got sent to Germany. He got stationed overseas. Again, what's my mom going to do? She had no job skills, two young kids. So she went to Germany, but by then it was clear the relationship really wasn't working out. And so they never really lived together over there. My mom uh, was as adventurous as I am, if not more so. She just thought, well, I'm here in Germany anyways. I'm just going to get myself an apartment. And she did. She found an apartment in the German, in a German neighborhood. And she even put my sister and me in German kindergarten. Uh, we spoke no German whatsoever, but she thought it would be a good experience for us. And it was, I mean, it was traumatic at first because we couldn't, this one kid kept hitting us and we couldn't even tell him to stop because we didn't know how to speak German. But when you're that young, you learn how to speak another language real quick. So anyway, long story short, that's why my mom didn't choose to move to base housing because my dad basically abandoned her. Okay, here's another hot button question from Julie. Are you pro-life, pro-choice, and why? I will say that Julie privately emailed me and she got pretty heated about it. And so I was like, well, why are you even asking me? You seem like you already made your mind up about me. And then she apologized and came forth with her backstory. And basically the long and the short of it is even if somebody's being a jerk to you online or just acting rude, there's a reason for it. You know, nobody's a jerk just for no reason. You know, most, she had a lot of, she had a painful experience. Okay. 
Now, what is my position on pro-life, pro-choice? I guess I consider myself pro-choice, but I, I completely understand why people would be pro-life because it is, I mean, abortion is killing a human life, okay? Is a human life more valuable than a bug or a cow? I mean, I eat steak all the dang time. I don't know. It's like with everything. I'm sort of in the middle. I see both positions and I see why people are so passionate about saving these babies, but I also see you know, frankly, I see a lot of people having kids that really shouldn't have kids, and it's not the kid's fault. I get it. It's complicated, and my feelings on it are way too complicated than I can answer in the parameters of this video. Okay, Dawn says, My husband and I love watching your adventures with all the garbage you see on the news and everywhere. You always put a smile on our face. What kind of music do you like? Ah, huh, there's a nice question. Dawn, I like all kinds of music. I'm not huge into rap or hip-hop, but I even do like to listen to some gangster rap and hip-hop. Uh, I like country, old country, new country. I love 50s music, 40s music, 30s music. I love classical music. I love doo-wop. I love... I don't love thrash metal or industrial. Anything that's too aggressive or angry or that has really nasty lyrics I'm not really into, but anything that has a fun melody and a good beat really doesn't matter to me what genre it is. I will say the only genre I don't like is contemporary Christian music. I'm not, I don't consider myself a Christian. I have nothing against Christians, and I think Christianity has some great teachings, but contemporary Christian music just ain't my jam. I say contemporary because I like old-timey, like old gospel, like give me that old-time religion or I'm gonna lay down my burdens down by the riverside, like all that old-timey stuff, love. The newer stuff, mm, not so much. Okay, here's a humdinger. I lost the email. The, somebody emailed me a bunch of extremely personal questions. I couldn't find the email, so I don't know the person's name. And I don't remember all the questions they asked, but one of them was, when was the first time I had sex? I mean, excuse me. I don't even know you, but I'll tell you because I'm an open book. I was a late bloomer. I didn't start drinking till I was 23. I didn't get my driver's license till I was 23. And I didn't have sex till I was 24. And it happened to be, I moved to Vegas. <laughs> I was a virgin, man. I was, oh my God, Vegas. <laughs> what did it do to me? No, I don't know. I guess I didn't have any boyfriends in high school or college. So just no opportunity ever arose. But I lost my virginity in the year two, 2001 at the Bellagio Hotel in Vegas. At least it was a beautiful, sumptuous place to do the deed. Uh, and on this sort of a related note, we're gonna get into all these romance questions now. Anonymous asks, I know you were married once, do you? <laughs> but is there any chance of having a man around? Okay, first of all, I've never been married, so I don't know where you got that idea and how you could be so confident as to say you know I was married. Uh, I was never married, and there's definitely a chance of having a man around. I'm straight. A lot of people think I'm gay. In fact, people in the town I live in, I heard this one guy was telling people, they're not really sisters. They're lesbians. Hey, that's fine. I have no problem with lesbians. I have a lot of cool lesbian friends, and I actually like lesbians a lot. But I don't identify as lesbian. I'm not sexually attracted to women. I'm sexually, sexually attracted to men. And so is there any chance of having a man around? Yeah, I just... I don't seem to meet very many men that I like like that, unfortunately. And I, I've known a lot of really cool guys, and there's more questions <laughs> I'm going to get into this, but very few of them have really tripped my trigger, as they say. Uh, Anonymous also says he hopes I'm still selling my magic beans. Yes, I am, but I can't talk about that here. Okay, now Debbie asks, <laughs> oh man, only because you've hinted that one day you may fill us in on what happened, can you please tell us about the relationship drama? Was that in 2022 or 2021? I had a very, very toxic relationship in 2020. So it was before 2022 or 2021. And it was just terrible. I still don't feel at liberty to discuss it because of the other people involved. Uh, I'll just say it was very eye-opening. It gave me a great deal of empathy for other people. Before that, I would see people in these toxic relationships and go, God, what an idiot. Just break up with him. But now, or after that experience, I sort of understood why it's not always that easy. But yeah, Debbie, it's actually a really good story. And it involves, well, let's just say it involves some characters that have been in my videos. And there was so much petty drama and intrigue. It would make for an amazing tea spilling vlog, but I'm not quite that desperate yet. Okay, uh, 
Somebody asked me this question actually from my last Q&A, but I didn't get to it because they sent it too late. So I'll answer it now. Were you and Larry dating? And if so, are you still together? You mentioned in one of your videos about coming out of a negative relationship, and I was hoping it wasn't with him, as he seems like a decent guy. Okay, you remember Larry? Larry used to be in a lot of videos with me. Again, I'm not going to drag anybody through the mud here or say too much, but I'll just say I was never dating Larry, and that wasn't the relationship I was in. But I will also say that not everyone is what they seem. Okay, that's all I'm going to say about that. Okay, here's a question from somebody who has a YouTube channel, I think, called Find Your Alpha. And Find Your Alpha wants to know, what kind of men do you prefer? Nice guys or bad boys? Which have you dated more of over the years? Sounds to me like it's an alpha male type channel. And on those, my, my understanding of alpha male culture is like, no, girl, girls always want the bad guy. They never want to date the nice guy. Nice guys come in last. Well, Find Your Alpha... I haven't dated that many people, to be honest. I'm my, I'll be honest with everybody. My romantic life, my entire romantic history has been really nothing short of an unmitigated dumpster fire. It's pretty depressing, and it is one of my biggest regrets. But I don't know. I'm not attracted to that many people, and the people that I have been attracted to almost always turned out to be the wrong person. And not because they were bad boys. I dated, well, like the guy I dated, the white bread guy. He was a super nice guy. Um, and I dated him the longest out of anyone. Bad boys, I, I don't, I never really dated a bad boy. I never dated anyone who went to prison or anything like that or was a thief. But I dated, did some, I mean, I dated a couple guys that were in the military and you think, oh yeah, heroes. Those guys were the biggest freaks of all, especially one of them. Oh my God, the one guy I dated was, well, I don't want to give too many details, but he was a colonel in the Air Force. He was a fighter jet pilot, you know, all-American hero. But he was also an all-American freak who was dating two other people at the same time as me. Oh, gosh, I don't want to drag anybody through the mud. Uh, the answer to the, your question, Finder Alpha, is I like weird guys. I don't like nice guys or bad boys. I like just weirdos. Okay, we're getting to the end. Malia wants to know, did you ever want kids if you found a partner that you wanted to spend your life with? Or was it never in your plan? Well, I guess I grew up sort of thinking like, okay, I'm eventually going to fall in love and get married and have kids. Well, unfortunately, it never happened. I told you I didn't have any boyfriends in high school. I kind of dated this one guy, but it was only because he relentlessly kept hitting on me and I wasn't attracted to him. And finally, I just sort of gave in. But it's not like we ever did anything. I think I kissed him once. That was about it. And, I mean, he was a very nice guy. But uh, anyway, I never met anybody, sadly, that I wanted to be in a relationship with enough to have kids. And I kind of did grow up not wanting to have kids because, like I said earlier, my brother's 12 years younger than me and my other sister's nine years younger. I grew up changing a lot of diapers and my mom was a hardworking single mom. So she didn't have, you know, I had to do a lot of babysitting and housekeeping. And oh, I just, I didn't, I wanted to have some time to just go have fun. I didn't want to have kids. And to this day, I still feel pretty good with my decision not to have kids. Every now and then I see, actually, no, I don't ever see people with kids and go, oh, I wish I had a kid. But every now and then it just occurs to me like, oh, well, there probably is something really cool to motherhood, you know? because it gives you a whole new perspective on life. And all of a sudden now you have a whole nother life you're living for. But I've never actually felt that way enough to regret not having had kids. I regret not having met a partner that I liked enough to have kids with, but I don't regret not having had the kids. That's not to say I couldn't get married uh, if I wanted to, because I got a few marriage proposals right here. Bob asks, will you marry me? I'm serious, LOL. As your hubby, and as a retired 20-year professional truck driver with 2 million plus safe mileage award, I assure you I would gladly drive you on all your travels. Oh, that's very sweet, Bob. Like I always say, I'm not the marrying kind, so uh, I appreciate your kind proposal, but for now I'm going to have to politely decline. Same to Mr. Tab, also asked, will you marry me? His offer is we could wed at the Little Vegas Chapel and have Elvis Presley officiate. Well, Mr. Tab, that is a very tempting offer, but I am not the marrying kind. And finally, Mark asks, will you not marry me? Because I'm not the marrying kind either. Mark, I accept your proposal. Oh, now Barry asks, if you and I get married, do you make enough to support us both? Well, I guess that depends on what kind of lifestyle you're accustomed to, 
Barry. I mean, if you want to camp out in the mountains in a busted old canned ham and eat Frito pie for dinner seven nights a week, then yeah, I can support us both. But we're still not getting married. Okay, we're finally at the last question. Uh, this is from Anonymous, who says, Since you were called the worst woman in the world, why don't you capitalize on that and make merch with it? You could have a pic of you flashing the peace sign and showing your hairy pits. <laughs> Sorry about that. You could also tease about your time in YouTube jail. Blah, 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 blah. Basically, he's saying I should... Because uh, my Burning Man video, or I think a post I made on an interview I did in The Guardian got reblogged on... Uh, Barstool Sports, and they called me the worst woman in the world, and I should never be allowed to go to Burning Man again, blah, blah, blah. He's saying I should just run with it and capitalize on it. And I get that. I know that country singer Marion Morris just did that because somebody called her a country... I think uh, Tucker Carlson called her a country music weirdo or something, so she made t-shirts that said country music weirdo. Or, I can't remember. Yeah, I, I get it. That would be kind of funny, but I'd rather just ignore the whole thing. I'm not going to give them any more of my mental bandwidth. So no t-shirts calling me the worst woman in the world. And I'm not flashing my pits at anybody. Uh, what do you call it? I don't know. I'm not flashing my pits in anyone's face just to gross them out or piss them off. Um, I'm surprised nobody asked me about my pits in this Q&A. It's not like I'm doing it to make anybody mad. It's just a it's not even a choice. It just happened. You know, I, I shave them, but they just keep growing back. And finally, Anonymous also says they would love an updated casita tour and how I survive in it during the winter because it's not insulated. Well, I'll do an updated casita tour when I get home this winter. It's not insulated, but I live in Death Valley. It doesn't get that cold. Gets down in the 30s here and there, but generally it only gets down into the 40s at night and guess what i'm sleeping in this travel trailer up here and it's been in the 30s and 40s at night up here and i'm not saying it's fun but uh back in death valley at least i have a radiator i can plug in um and i'm hoping to get a mini split put in the casita i have to have the electrical updated first and so i'm hoping my friend terry comes out to visit and fixes the electrical so that i can hire good old gunnies from Pahrump, Nevada. Shout out to Gunnies, if you're watching, to come out and put in a mini split because that way I'll have an air conditioner in the summer and a heater in the winter. Anyway, that's it for my 250,000 quarter million Q&A special. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for asking me all those very probing questions. Hope you enjoyed my answers and I hope to see all of you at my 300K Q&A.